Good morning. Thank you, Mia. That was awesome. Good morning. Joyeux fête de Père. Alles guten zum Watertag. If you're a father, or if you had, if you have a father, or if you had a father, this day is for you. My name is Bruce Grierson, and I'll be your service associate this morning. And to ease us into the sacred frame of mind that we try to cultivate around here, I invite you now into our ritual of centering. If your heart is full this morning, if there's something you're feeling particularly grateful for, you may like to come up and light a candle for joy over on this side. Or if you're struggling, if, if the weather inside you is a bit like the weather that we've been experiencing these last few days outside, you may wish to come up on this side where Adriana is and drop a stone into the water, knowing that your burden is being spread across this community. I'm gonna ask Lila over here to carry, oh, it was extinguished. I was gonna say, carry, <laughs> carry the fire from there, please, up, and we're going to light our chalice this morning. Are you ready? We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. Now that's a flame. Thanks. Thanks, Lila. All right. Now, Adriana Schulte has a little bit of Gen Z fizz for us. This is a spoken word slam poet from Australia, and I'll let uh, Adriana introduce this fellow just a little bit. Thank you. This is a Game Changer by Soleil Raphael, who was the youngest ever winner of the Australian Poetry Slam at age 12. He's now 17 and he lives in Melbourne. Can you hear That might work Is this better. better? All right. This is Game Changer by Soleil Raphael. I am a game changer. I am a game changer, change game, low age, no range, outside a ranger. I am both yes and no, stay and go, catch and throw, goodbye and hello, forest ranger. I am the lightning that makes thunder rumble. I am the space outside of the box. I am the magnetic field between the moon and the sea. I am the quality inequality. I am the undiscovered myth in wordsmith. I am the reality of my own big dreams. I am the curve of the world that I can only just see. I am a game changer. I am a curly hair, very rare level of sublimity. I am a square of fresh air. I am the fair in share, a spare pair of players for stairs to infinity. I am a game changer. No matter how much you change, no matter how much the world changes, no matter how much change changes, I will always be changing as I am a game changer. Oh yeah. We are the North Shore Unitarian Church. We take it as our mission to empower people to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. Whether you're a longtime member or visiting us for the first time, we're glad you found your way to our little sanctuary in the woods. In this community, we celebrate people from all walks of life, no matter how you make your living or how you experience the sacred, no matter who you are or who you love, we hope you feel welcome here. Let us acknowledge each other, the deep humanity of each other, as we are gathered on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil people. It's a privilege to be able to live and work and find meaning here. And to sing here. Let us join together singing the song, Come Sing a Song with Me. <laughs> Thank you. 
So today, you're going to hear a little bit about the coming of age ceremony. If you're not familiar with this ritual in Unitarian Universalism, it involves young people who are around 13 years old. It basically says, we, have, we as a congregation have arbitrarily decided that you today are not a kid anymore. <laughs> so you're being called up to the big club. And frankly, this is as much for our development as yours. We can really use your energy and your ideas in the room your optimism and your big hearts, and your tech skills. Yeah. Coming of age day is a real three hanky affair. Many UU say it sealed the deal for them wanting to join this faith. They were church shopping and they happened to come on this particular Sunday and they thought, holy cow, whatever's happening here that it grows humans like this, I want in. Now, it turns out we have a bit of a supply chain issue at the moment, no youth are coming of age today. So instead, you're going to hear from two members, Adriana and Lila, who were, who were up on this stage a couple of years ago, accepting their thorny rose, passing under the human arch, everybody masked up for COVID. A couple of ice ages have come and gone since then, it feels like. So Adriana and Lila have had time to reflect on moments and milestones here that have been meaningful to them and including in the mix of what they're going to talk about, I'm pretty sure is going to be their credos. Now, a credo is, basic, is a snapshot of your spiritual beliefs right now. There's an introspection part of this, and there's a bravery part. The introspection part is the fearless moral inventory, figuring out where you actually do stand, and the bravery part is getting up in front of everybody and sharing it. I've often thought credo writing is an exercise that we could all benefit from, not just the youth. So actually today, you're gonna to get a chance to try, if you're interested, in the spirit zone. After the service, we're inviting you to think about what your credo would be at this stage of your life. And you can even try to write one. We have some pens and scratch paper. You might be surprised at what bubbles up from the depths of you. Now, I'd like to just briefly share something from my own perspective as a youth advisor, which it's been my privilege to be for the last eight years or so here. So one thing I've noticed about the youth here is, and there are so many cool things, but this one feels particularly important right now, is that they resist categorical thinking. And I'm not saying they're without biases, nobody is, but they have made it a habit to fight those biases. So, and what happens when you do that is that the lines between things grow fainter. The very idea of categories starts to make less and less sense. Everything becomes non-binary, not just gender, everything. If that's the lens you see the world through, then in theory, what also falls away is the idea of us and them. So not team, no teams, just individuals. But I will tell you from what I've observed, from what I've observed, and by the way, it sounds like I'm, I'm studying baboons in the wild here, and I, I don't mean to I'd apologize for that, but let me just share this final one of my field notes. Uh, this business of us and them, no teams, just individuals, there is still a team that the UU youth see and appreciate and want to be on. It's just that it's a different kind of team. It's not a team of people who share the same beliefs. It's a team of people who share the same dispositional traits, the same character traits, if you like. So what do those character traits look like? A short story to illustrate. 
last year, Richard Kwan and Kit Toe and I took some of our youth to a con across, uh, across the city at UCV. A con is a youth, a youth conference. And it was amazing, as these cons always are. And on the last night, there was a talent show. So these things are mostly for the youth participating, but sometimes the advisors get up there and do something. So I performed a magic trick, or at least I tried to. <laughs> it went totally sideways. <laughs> you guys remember this. It just didn't work. And when a magic trick flops, that's another level of awkward. It's, it's worse than a joke that gets no laughs because people kind of don't know what to do. So my trick fell flat, and that was it, and a little cloud of humiliation followed me back to my seat. And afterwards, independently, two youth came up to me, and the first one said, very quietly and sincerely, don't worry, you'll crush it next time. <laughs> and the other one didn't say anything at all. She just sat next to me, put her arm around me, and left it there. Putting your arm around someone is a gesture. Leaving it there is ministry. I thought then, and I continue to think, this, this is a team I want to be on too. Adriana and Lila and Annabelle, who's been playing for you today and is going to play some more, it has been such a privilege to sit in your cheering section for these years. And to Richard Kwan, who's been a, uh, a youth advisor all year, thank you. I was trying to see if he's here. Thank you for your steady hand and your chill vibe. It's been an honor. Would the ushers please prepare to collect the offering as we listen to Annabelle flout her flout, flaunt her flouting. I knew I'd mess that up. yourselves and uh, away you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Thank lovely. you for the okay. stuff. So sweet. <laughs> Hi. Hi guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us today. I'm Adriana Schulte. I'm Lila Grierson. Uh, yeah. um, we're really excited to be here during finals week. Oh, it's the best. <laughs> today we were hoping to explain a little bit more about what exactly the youth group does. Plus, what the process is like in religious education and how we got here. We also want to squeeze in a bit about our credo writing process. Yeah, uh, let's see a show of hands. Who's written a credo in the last five years? Ooh. Ooh, we got a few, we got a few. 
Looks like we're kind of the experts here. <laughs> Looks like it. <laughs> we thought that a good place to start today would be with the Youth Group Covenant. We wrote this one two years ago now, so it's due for a bit of an update. Uh, yeah, we usually update it when we get new people, so they get to start things off with a clear track for their voice to be heard. We have a lot of kind of like rules on here, but they're all in uh, three kind of general zones. Things that make meetings go smoother, things that are important to the actual like purpose of youth group, and don't be a... Beep! <laughs> yes. Our first rule is almost always Robbie's rule or some variation of it. So Robbie's rule, for those who are unfamiliar, Robbie was a young boy who got bullied quite a bit, and he found that when people were having conversations, they would stand so that nobody could join in on the conversation and <laughs> felt excluded there. So he came up with a system to make everyone feel welcome, which is to leave a space in any conversation so that everyone knows that they could join. Example. <gasps> Oh my god, did you hear about that thing? The latest cool thing that all the kids are into? Oh my god, yeah. <gasps> Crazy. Oh, hi, Robbie. How are you? Uh, do you want to talk about the latest cool thing that all the kids are into? Fantastic. <laughs> um, we also have um, step up, step back on here, which is a rule that's uh, been changed in recent years to read as take space, make space, to try to remove ableist language. Yeah, that's one reason we update the covenant. Uh, it's not always got the language that is used nowadays. So take space, make space means take up space when you have something important to say, but also let there be space for other people to have their voices heard. Yeah, the most important rule is probably that like super faded one <laughs> right here near the bottom. Uh, it's a set of rules about respect. Uh, this one probably comes up the most often and it kind of encloses a lot of the other rules. Yeah, that's the ouch-oops rule. Ouch-oops is an acknowledgement that someone's feelings have been hurt and an apology without dwelling too much on it so you can keep going with your conversation. Yeah, you can always come back to it later, but it doesn't need to take up all the space in the room. Um, yeah, but our covenant usually doesn't need to be like enforced much in the same way that like your code <laughs> of conduct at school is because most of these are habits or kind of like obvious rules of being nice, <laughs> but they're still nice to have something that we can just kind of point to, just in case. Yeah, and about half our meetings are just talking right now, the other half are activities that different youth organize. Uh, yeah, so I organized the cookie baking activity for December, and Laura brought kind of all the ingredients, and a lot of the other youth brought tools like pans or like measuring spoons, and we had a lot of fun. I remember that. Um, we had Sol from UCV there. We get to work with UCV a lot. They're another Unitarian church. Mm -hmm. uh, since our youth group is pretty small, it's nice to have more people to connect with, and it's also just nice to talk to UUs who aren't from NSUC, although you're all lovely. Yes, yes, you are. Ooh, remember when we found out that they say different words when they light their chalice? Mind blown. <laughs> totally same. Man. Uh, do you want to talk about the youth in social justice program? Yeah, that's kind of a sad one. So since COVID, we haven't really been doing any community service, either at NSUC or in the greater community. We even stopped serving coffee. We were online for a while, and it was hard to get anything going. And now we don't know how to get started with it. Yeah, so a lot of the people who used to set up this stuff and contribute so much work to it just uh, couldn't work with us in youth group anymore, either because they left the church or they got too busy or something happened. So if you think you have something for youth group to contribute to, like, let us know, let Bruce know, let Richard know, We're putting you on the spot here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, now, before we get going with the next sort of segment, religious education, uh, we want to provide you with a brief disclaimer. We wanted to make this, uh, as the true theater kids we are, an earth-shatteringly beautiful performance, all about the power of youth. But therein lies the problem. We are but youth, and as such, we have classes, finals, <laughs> and are running on six hours of sleep and four shots of espresso. <laughs> Ah, this will be more a stream of consciousness, which, if you think about it, gives you a fuller insight into the mind of adolescence than any perfectly planned out, perfectly delivered presentation. This is who we are inside our heads. Uh, come inside with us and we'll serve you some tea. So, you remember kids going down through the arch of arms? You may even have wondered where they were whisked off to. Here's the other side of the curtain. As Kinda, sorta, maybe a little children. 
we feel uniquely qualified to offer our insight on this matter. So the arch goes up, we hold you in our love is sung, and all the kids scramble downstairs. The urgency was undue, but the enthusiasm was appreciated. Uh, on downstairs, there's three places that kids can go. The absolute youngest ones, we're talking like the kindergartners, go with Joy Silver and get to experience the story baskets. That room was the unsung hero of my youth. So many formative memories came about when learning of other religions, and it never occurred to me that this was a radical activity. Learning about other cultures, other religions, that should be in every classroom. Like, education leads to understanding, understanding leads to acceptance, and only once we've opened our mind to acceptance can the work of inclusion begin. That lesson taught me more than any little skit on sharing crayons ever could. Absolutely. So I didn't do that. I got <laughs> bored with coming to church every morning, and I only came back later, and then it was only for the free food. Diversity of faith journeys! First-hand account. In the room beside the young'uns were the Middle Ages. It's not what we called ourselves. I just thought it would be so good. Um, in that class, it was all about the principles and learning about them through comprehensive activities. So we'd put on a skit about equality, play human knot, the good stuff. The last room held the most memories for Adrienne and I. Inquiring souls, run by Bill and Jessica. It was more than just teal walls and plush couches. It was our own room of requirement. Anything we wanted to talk about, it went up on a poster. We were all handed pens, all handed voices, and allowed to use them. Carpe stylus, you might have heard. Seize the pen, take up space. There's enough room for everyone. In fact, there was one action we'd start every meeting with. I was hoping we could do it here, because a comfortable room alone isn't enough to feel safe in. It takes effort, a desire to bring your favorite part of yourself. And to access this part, we would breathe together. I invite you all to partake in this ritual with us, which I will lead. And yes, it is just breathing, but when we do it together, it feels specialer. Okay, so. Breathing out all of the toxins accumulated over the week and replacing it with fresh air and love for ourselves and others. Thank you. You all did great at that. When we did it, <laughs> when we did it, it just turned into a holding your breath the longest contest. Yeah, which was very useful for my lifeguarding course. After we were done with that, we'd get into the discussion question of the day. We brainstormed ideas at the start of a new church season, but we'd always end up adding a ton anyways. Topics ranged from, who's the worst person in the Harry Potter series? To, a whole list of other ones, like, why are video games so addictive? Why is, why do we die? Oh, jeez. Why are we here? Why so many whys? Why does banana candy taste like extinct varieties? <laughs> Truly, uh, we were very in touch with the topics of import to the young people of the congregation. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, some of my best conversations took place in that room. And it fostered a sense of democracy, because we all had provocative opinions. <coughs> Bellatrix is strange. It's Bellatrix is strange. <sighs> Most villainous? No way. <laughs> and yet we listened to each other. I remember when it came time for another inquiring soul to speak, even if they were advocating against my position, I would shush everybody else in the room just so that they could tell me I was wrong in a respectful silence. And one day, we had a new girl come into our room. Uh, she had been given by her Catholic school the assignment of reporting on any other religion. And she chose Unitarian Universalism. <laughs> she sat with us on the couches, pulled out a notepad and paper, and asked her first question. What do Unitarians believe in? <laughs> there was a beat of silence. Adriana, who was new... Newish. Newish, said, I think Unitarianism is an acceptance of everyone. It's even in the introduction. No matter how you make your living, no matter how you experience the sacred, no matter who you are or who you love, this is a religion that values diversity and acceptance and honors everyone's paths to spirituality. I follow that by saying, yes, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a place where people come to learn about all religions and from that choose the aspects they would like to bring into their <laughs> daily lives. If you know who you are, you're welcome here. If you want to know who you are, you're welcome here. 
And if you don't want to know who you are, I can only assume that's because you're so certain in your beliefs that you feel complete, in which case, definitely come here and share some of that wisdom with us. I'd love to feel that confident. We were very helpful. <laughs> So we were going around the room sharing our interpretation of faith, and when her turn came around, Annabelle looked up, said, atheist, and passed the floor to the next person. Meanwhile, this poor schoolgirl still hasn't written anything. Her pen is hovering above the page, her head is swiveling each way, trying to find the answer that she thought would be simple. Eventually, she gave up and decided to skip to the next question. What do Unitarians believe happens after you die? Again, our answers through her. I mean, it depends on who you ask. I believe in reincarnation. I believe we decompose in the earth and continue the cycle that way. I believe that if we are good in life, we'll have a pleasant afterlife. Although I don't know what that looks like. I believe souls can't be forgotten, and so the love accumulated through a lifetime finds new places to go after you die. I believe we rot in the ground. <laughs> you have to believe, so I was just winging it. <laughs> So helpful. I think she went next door. Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> Poor thing. So unprepared for our weirdness. And that's what I find so shocking, because even outside of this church, I've had conversations with my friends that went more or less exactly like that. The diversity of faith, of belief in young people, especially, is pretty astounding. There's this belief that youth today are hardcore pessimists, that we want to burn everything down and start again. And as cool as the bartering system would be, I also kind of like the world we're living in right now. Sure, the earth is... Beep! But look at how hard we're trying to get to be better. Gen Z's got all the pressure on because the crisis isn't going to wait for us to grow up. At least here in this congregation, we're encouraged to think about what matters to us. Encouraged to look at questions as tools instead of as obstacles. I want to take a minute and remind everyone the power of a question. Seven questions were used to scaffold every credo that our batch of youth wrote. And we wrote some good ones. We wrote about loving the moment, hating people, singing louder, talking softer, and everything in between. We talked to each other a little while writing our credos, but it was actually a very solitary experience. That was the weird part. Thanks to inquiring minds, we could carpe that stylus like the best of them, but we were used to bouncing off of each other. Yeah, and that's actually what made it fascinating. We were expected to think for ourselves in a very drastic way, and that made me feel actually respected. The adults all around us, especially Lynn and our mentors, hi, Catherine. <laughs> hi, Jenny. <laughs> would ask me things like, genuinely, with no hidden motives. Like, you just want to hear what my mind is capable of when you ask me to come up with an answer to everything? There isn't a right answer? There's no bubble sheet? <laughs> I know, it was so exciting and terrifying to be let wild like that. At the time we were writing, I was 13, but I felt like I was a million years older than everyone because I was the only one in my friend group who wanted to talk about philosophical theories and the meaning of life. It was disappointing hanging out with my friends and when asked the question, so, what do you guys think about the idea that time is a construct? They'd reply with blank stares, but here, we were asked to think about questions just like that one. All these big thoughts I'd been accumulating over the years finally had a place to go, and people wanted to listen to me? It was too good to be true. <laughs> to this day, I've not found another space that fosters introspective growth as much as the coming-of-age program. Sitting beside a bunch of other teens in a dried-up riverbed under the scalding sun was the closest I've gotten to spiritual enlightenment. I was just happy to be in my own space, writing up my own little jam, and I'm sure a lot of the others felt the same way. Right, Annabelle? No. <laughs> oh. Valid. It was a pretty crazy experience. Yeah. Um, our adults tried to find like the weirdest places for us to write in <laughs> to encourage us to think creatively. And I personally wrote in quite a few weird places that they didn't even think of. Uh, my favorite was a wooden sculpture in the middle of a clearing. My favorite was a concrete bridge in the middle of a forest. Oh, and I loved picking out our credo books. Mine was beautiful. A soft green bird on the cover made me think of pistachio rose cake, which is my favorite spring bake. It made me think of new growth and possibility. I felt powerful armed with this. Yeah, I got last pick. 
and mine looked like something that a toddler would draw, to which you'd reply, looks great, sweetie, so tell me what I'm looking at. Well, it's what's on the inside that counts. Oh, what's inside yours? Were those originals? Oh, very nice. Are we about to pull back the curtain? I dare say. I dare say. What did you put for question one? Think about any experiences you have had that you cannot explain, or that made you wonder if there were more to the universe than we know. Oh, I wrote quite a bit for this one. Here's a taste. There was one time I was standing in the middle of my bedroom, staring out my window at the forest, and I felt something hit my heart. I, no joke, sank to my knees and felt as though I could feel the stars hanging in the sky and the heartbeat of everyone I knew inside my own. Yugen. It's a Japanese word. It means an understanding of the universe that triggers an emotional response too deep for words. I must have laid that sunbeam for three minutes. I couldn't tell you what I was thinking about, but I felt full. As though, <laughs> as though I had been trying to ladle soup all my life, but not pushing it down far enough to get any soup. And finally, I'd submerged the ladle and filled my cup, and now I could begin to eat. Yes, I know. Quite a dramatic child, wasn't I? And then it devolves into soup metaphors. The mind of a child is a curious thing. Well, I wrote like a sentence, and then I wanted to keep looking busy, so I just started describing what was going on around me. Do you want to hear what I wrote about you? Yes. <laughs> she is looking into the sunlight. Who knows where? Lila. <laughs> <laughs> she takes up her pen and rereads almost constantly. Does that sound about right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was the hardest question for you to answer? Question four. How can I make the world a better place? How am I connected to the whole? You couldn't think of anything? I thought of stuff. I just wanted to try to condense it into an overarching statement. I wanted to find a foundational thing, like share oneself, that I thought covered everything that making, a better wor making the world a better place could be. So you missed the forest for the trees. Exactly. How was your experience with four? Oh. <laughs> I don't want to be part of the whole. <laughs> I want there to be a whole, so I'm not the only human alive, but I don't want to do what they do. I guess that means I'm on my way to being forgotten. If you're always holding the camera, there are no pictures of you. The only connection I want with other people is through words. Words make the world a better place, because they can make people happy in a way that I cannot. So you just went for pure angst. I love it. <laughs> Um, of course, all this writing was just a way to build to the true question, question seven. To what do you give your heart? That's the question foundational to credo writing. Mm. Yeah, we saw people give their hearts to all sorts of things. The earth, hating other people, loving other people. But uh, through it all, we, we knew that we wanted to create something. We wanted to create something to give our heart to. We had quite a diverse batch that year. Do you have any parting thoughts on Kritos? I think that they're more and more important these days. There's so much content pouring into us all the time that it's harder and harder to distinguish our thoughts from other people's. I think a 14-year-old me put it best. Kritos are easier said than done, but that's probably, spelled incorrectly, <laughs> why they're so important to help us remember the things that we value, even when they're hard to do. We both had really positive credo writing experiences by just sitting down and writing in nature. But that's not for everybody. Use whatever resources you have. The important thing isn't a presentation or conforming to some norm. It's for you, by you. Whatever helps you out, whatever helps you out is the most worthwhile investment of your credo writing time. That was very well said. And I'd just like to add, to close out our segment. Already? No. But I love the attention. <laughs> so do I. That's why we're the ones who are up here. Uh, but there are plenty of youth in youth group who do not like all the attention. 
We just want to make sure that other youth, both the current ones and the ones to be, get to have that same opportunity. So unfortunately, we're going to wave a temporary goodbye and let Annabelle and Allison take it away. Thank you. So just before we bring this home, a couple of announcements. Uh, on June 23rd, that's this coming Friday, everyone's invited to join fellow congregants and your new board at 6 p.m. here at the church for a wine and cheese event. Also following next Sunday's service, that's June 25th, the last service of the church here, there'll be a barbecue. I think they're still looking for volunteers to help set up or take down. Uh, let Janny know if you're able to do that. Um, Darius is apprenticing with us today on the camera, and he 
he and you and Khan, you and Khan next week are going to be the show, right? You're going to take over for Malcolm, give him a week off. That's awesome. Thank you for that. And again, if you'd like to learn more about the credo writing process or you'd like to try it yourself, come back and join us here in the sanctuary in 15 minutes or so after you've had some coffee. Bring your coffee up if you like and give it a go. And we do everything by firelight around here, but now it's time to put our little flame to bed. I'll ask Lila up to bring us full circle and extinguish our flame. Actually, to add on to the coffee bit, if you do bring your cups upstairs, please do bring them back downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise, I have to you know, go on a scavenger hunt to try and clean them up. Uh, so please just bring them back downstairs. Thank you. I complicated things for you there, Annabelle. We, we extinguish this flame. The world calls to us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth with courage and love. And now finally, I'd, I'd encourage you to stand if you're able. And if you've ever been to a youth con, you know this, this next song is familiar to everyone. It's almost a UU anthem. It's called Swimming to the Other Side.
Hmm. Well, it's been wonderful to be part of this service this morning. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you to everybody who helped with this service. Go out into the world in peace, knowing this community holds you and cherishes you. Let's circle around.